Lord God, thank you so much for calling us to this place at this time. Help us better understand your word. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. Pray for Debbie in Canada. I told her last night when I talked to her, please don't get into trouble. Please don't get into trouble. Because what I've read about Canadian jails. That's I told her. It's just like a Turkish jail. <laughs> a jail in, in Winnipeg. Yeah. It's just like being in Turkey. Um, Change the wall. Yeah. Okay, we're we're finishing up Galatians tonight. Um, and and next week we're gonna start Romans. We're gonna look at start looking at Romans. Uh, which would be really good. That is Paul's letter. You want to know what Paul believes? Boom, you look at Romans. Uh, but we're looking at Galatians, Paul's letter. Now, when, when, we, when you think about the Galatian, he's writing about a problem. And what is the problem in the Galatian church? What, what has happened in the Galatian church? They get second-hand, secondhand information. Okay, they're getting second-hand information. And one in particular is the second-hand information they're getting. What have the Galatians been taught? By someone who came after Paul. That they need to be circumcised. Okay, that they need to be circumcised. Now, Paul takes that and applies it broader. What, what are the Galatians... It, the issue is circumcision. We found that out last time we met. What did... How does Paul broaden it out? That it's not just circumcision, it's obeying the law. They're, they're yeah. adding to the gospel. They're adding to the gospel. Mm -hmm. and, and this seems to be the issue. That some, some folks from Jerusalem have come to the, the Galatian church, probably Christians from Jerusalem, uh, came to the Galatian church and started telling them that to complete their faith, Oh, they're, they're a bad bunch. Yeah, CD bunch. They drive SUVs. Um, the, um, but they told, came and um, evidently told the Galatians, in order to complete their faith, they needed to start obeying the law, which is not all that different than what a lot of Christians believe. You know, having faith in Jesus, repenting and confessing and all of that, we all accept. But, you know, if you want to even be a better Christian, you can do this. And God is even happier when you do that. And we start adding to the gospel. And, and what does Paul say is the problem when you start adding to the gospel? You take it away. You, that's exactly right. You take it away. Because what is at the core of the gospel? What, what is right at the center? Christ. Grace. Well, Christ and, and grace. You know, Christ is there, but Christ brought grace. And how does Paul describe grace? The grace he's talking about is... It's a gift we don't deserve, but is. given by God. Boom! You nailed it. It is a gift given by God that we don't deserve. How, in fact, do we respond to it? Because Paul says, grace is a gift given to us by God that we can't earn and we don't deserve. How then do we respond to grace? What's that? Yeah, thank him. We thank him before we can thank him, though. What do we? What does Paul say we do? And it's and it's really obvious when I say it. It's it's like a oh duh, of course. Get circumcised? Yeah, no, Paul <laughs> isn't going to say get circumcised. You you got to trust that it's there. Yeah. You know, grace is from a gift from God, and we respond by trusting that it's there. And once we trust that it's there, now we can offer thanks. Now we can offer praise. Now we can do other things. You know, confess, repent. We can do all that kind of stuff once we say that God is gracious to us. And that's what faith is. This faith is just trusting. And then remember, we've gone through, Paul gave uh, six different illustrations proving his point that our relationship with God is grounded in undeserved grace and us trusting. And remember, he talked about their personal experience when they first believed and they were filled with the Spirit and all excited. They didn't do anything. All they did was they heard and trusted. And don't, don't abandon that initial excitement to buy something else. That doesn't make sense. 
He used an example from the Old Testament. Remember the person he used to illustrate that it's really about it's really about grace and faith and not about law and obedience. Remember the guy he used? Talked about Abraham. And Abraham, God approached him. Abraham trusted him. Couldn't be based on law because Abraham lived before the law. You know, so it can't be obedience to the law because there was no law to obey. So he uses that example. He uses the example from contract law. Remember? That you can't change. Bill, this is one you are, you always got right off. You know about the contract law? If you write if you write a will or yeah. write a contract? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, my daughter pointed out one thing. <clears throat> she says she has POA. Okay. <clears throat> if I wait till I die. Yes. <clears throat> she says that POA doesn't do me anything. Right. But you, you need is a will. Right, exactly, so. exactly. And, and, and when you do, I know when I was in Virginia, Dad, I read my father's will. Oh, Lord have mercy, it was a lot of pages. Uh, but I read my, yeah, I skimmed a lot of it, you know. Uh, but my, I read my dad's will, uh, that he's, a new will that he's getting signed. You know, once he signs it, it's there. Yeah. And if he passes, I can't come in and say, with my brother, oh, let's go change. You know, part two. We didn't like part two. Yeah, uh, we will change that. You can't do that. Yeah. And if our relationship with God is based on grace, undeserved grace, we can't come in and say, yeah, but you also got to do this. You, you know, know, that's changing the will. My, my, my brother pointed out that I have write, I wrote the check for my to, to the attorney. Mm. And then that way I can say four people are going to split evenly. Mm -hmm. One of me and my wife. <laughs> that, that's, what, that's what it was in my dad's will. Yeah. You know, that's what he said. And so that was approved. He talks about uh, heirs and family relationships. You know, that you know, if you're underage and you inherit, you need a guardian. guardian. And the guardian is there and keeps you straight until you, until you become of age, and then the guardian isn't needed anymore. And that, he says, is a, was a function of the law. You know, therefore, the law was never intended to for us to keep forever. Mm -hmm. You know, at least in terms of relationship with God. At best, it was just before we were of age, and when Jesus died, we became of age. So he talked about that. Talked about his relationship with them. You know, how could you do this to me? Which I think is, you know, kind of getting rough uh, in terms of proof. Uh, and then the last one was that allegory that's interesting about the two mountains and the Hagar and, and Sarai. And the good news, and I'm, as I'm using that, I'm preaching that on Sunday. The allegory of Hagar and Sarah looking forward to it. Yeah. That's, people resonate when you hear that. All right, um, so these are all the proofs. Now the bottom line, Paul says, when we, see, he, when we move into the fifth chapter, what is Paul's conclusion? After giving all these proofs, what is his conclusion? What is his conclusion about our relationship with God? Oh, you know what I mean? Chapter 5? We're, we're reviewing. This yeah. is on a review. <laughs> but when we move to chapter 5, he says, because he kind of concludes his argument that he started in chapter 1, yeah. what does he say is the basis of a relationship with God? Grace. It is based on grace and it's based on trust. God gives us grace and we trust that it's there and that's it. You know, if circumcision was involved, then if it was necessary, then uh, grace wasn't needed because we could earn it. You know, we, we wouldn't need Jesus because we, could, we deserve it. We deserve what God gives us. And Paul says that is never the case. So his theological argument is done. We relate to God 
by God's grace and our faith response. Now, that's all well and good, but that really doesn't tell you how to, how to behave, right? That's really not a lot of guidance on what we should do out there in the world. And that's kind of what Paul is talking about in the fifth and sixth chapter. I told you one of the things you can see in Paul's letters, and we'll see it in Romans, same thing, between chapters 11 and 12. You, you, Paul will talk about his theology, what he believes, and then there's a point in the, the letter you can put your finger on when he shifts from this is what I believe to this is how it should affect the way you live. And in Paul, all of Paul's letters, man, that's, that happens. Sometimes it's early in the letter, sometimes it's late. But there's a place where he makes that shift, and that's what we're doing in chapter 5. We're making that shift into, we've talked about theology, now we're beginning to talk about ethics. Okay, looking right at the beginning, now we're going to start at 12, but we're going to look at, go back to 7 to sort of get a running start at it. What, what does he say in verse chapter 5, verse 7, has happened to the Galatians? had this, what were you doing, what did you do? What did, what did you do? Now, what is it that they had? What was the truth that they had? Yeah, that they had the gospel. Oh, the gospel. And the gospel is grounded in grace, right? And, and when you feel grace and respond with faith, for Paul, what, what happens to you? What do you now become with respect to the law? Just like when you're talking about a guardian. You didn't obey. What's that? You didn't obey. Free. Yeah, that's right. We're free. We don't. We no longer are bound to obey the law. Just like the guardian, we don't have to obey the guardian once we're of age. Yeah. Now that we're of age, we are. We have been set free because our relationship with God is not based on obedience. It is based on God's grace and our faith. Bang. That's the, that's the truth. That's what he spent now four chapters. You tell me where that says. Okay. You've run well. Well, no. He says, you not obey the truth. that's right. Who, who did hinder you that ye should not obey the truth? What is the truth? What's the truth that he has spent four chapters establishing? What's the truth? You ought to obey. Is that the truth? Is that the truth that Paul has worked to, to establish? That we got to obey God? Well, what's, okay. Well, what, no, what, what's the truth in the letter that Paul has established? What is true? Well, you should, 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 you should, should or not, should not, yeah. should not prove it or prove it. Well, what, what is, what has Paul spent four chapters establishing? And this is really the only thing. He's done it in different ways, but he's only done one thing for four chapters. He hasn't talked about, well, you've got to obey. What has he been talking about? You're not saved through works. You're not saved through works. God's, what did you say? You're not saved through works. You're not saved to work. No, no, saved through works. Oh, in other words... Okay. You don't become great with God by doing stuff. Okay. You get right with God because what? You trust him. You trust, but God has done it first. Yeah. We're right with God because God's shown us undeserved grace, and all we have to say is, it's there. That's trust and that it's there. That's what Paul has established. That's the truth. And they've fallen away from it. How, do we, how does Paul know they've fallen away for, from it? What do they now believe? That you got to be circumcised. You know, it isn't about faith anymore. It's about faith and circumcision. And then it's going to be faith, circumcision, and following the Sabbath. And then faith, circumcision, and uh, following the Sabbath. And then another law. You know, that's what Paul says. That's the problem with the law. They just, it gets, it keeps building. You can't have just one. You got to have more. You know, and then you got to break it down. Well, when do you get circumcised? You know, is it when you're young? Is it when you're old? What about women? You know, how do they fit into it? Well, we got to have a law for them. You know, all of a sudden it gets very, very complicated. And Paul says, when you start doing that, you have drifted away from what? 
the truth, the true gospel, right? Now, what, what, how, has this, how has this happened? What have they bought into? They bought into an old way that's being presented to them, been presented to them by just a few people, right? That have come in because he gives the illustration of what affects the whole loaf, a whole loaf of uh, a whole pile of dough in verse nine, a little, yeast. a little yeast. So it didn't take it didn't take a whole gang of people coming in and telling them this false message. You you only need a little bit of yeast, but it can change. The outcome it can change everything. Now, what does it's now? It's really interesting. That's what he says. So they've been deceived. They drifted away from the truth. Now, in verse ten, what does he say about the? How does he? What does he think about the Galatians? Why would he say that? Why would he after after telling the Galatians going through all of this and and saying that prevented you from obeying, now he sort of says that it's really not your fault. Why why do you think it's important for him to say that? He doesn't want to make complete enemies of you know. Good. There was a uh, there's a guy on on uh, British radio. I li- I love listening to him. I listen to him almost every day. And one of the things he says, and I, I love this, he says, you don't, he says, don't, yeah. don't blame the deceived. Don't blame the deceived. Blame what? Who should you blame? The deceiver. The deceiver. The deceiver. Don't blame the deceived. Blame the deceiver. But I think there should be an asterisk. Because if you allow yourself to continue to be deceived, then I think there's a point where you can, you know, you can blame. If you choose ignorance, uh, but if you're deceived, if you, it's not the deceived that should bear the brunt. It should be the deceiver. And, and that's what he's, he's talking about, right? Because the ones who have confused him, what does he say about them? Oh, no. Oh, no. In fact, if, if he had his way, sort of like I was saying about SUVs, if I were king of the world, you know, what does he say about the deceivers? The they will pay the penalty, and if I were the one dishing out the penalty, they should go ahead and oh, I... take, yes, take circumcision to the next next degree. You know, if Paul were king of the world, that's what they would do, but he isn't. So pretty, pretty harsh, right? So the the false teaching that the Galatians have bought into, been deceived, been confused in believing, is simply you can't have a relationship with God without what? Without circumcision, without obeying the law. And Paul says, as soon as you say that, what have you absolutely eliminated? What is, what is gone? Grace. Grace. Grace is gone. And, and you also don't need faith. Because faith is trust. And if you're doing everything you need to do, you don't need to trust. Trust isn't necessary. You know. You've done it. You know. So faith is gone. Grace is gone. And what makes it even more dramatic is with respect to the law, you are definitely not free. Right? You are bound to the law because you better obey it. Right? Because if you don't obey it, you won't feel heat later. You won't feel some heat later. Now, that's what Paul has told the Galatians. What is the danger in that message? You guys are free, free at last. Thank God Almighty, you are free at last. What's the danger? The practical danger, the ethical danger of believing that. If I say right now and you believe it, you buy it, you are free. You are absolutely free from free from the law. You have been set free from the law. What's the danger? Yeah. You do anything you want. You do anything you want. Ah, <laughs> yeah. you can do anything you want. 
You can just run amok. You know, we got Ten Commandments, right? I'm free from the law. Hot diggity dog. I'm thinking of seven that I might break. You know? Because I'm now free. free. That's a real danger. How does Paul, and Paul recognizes that. Theologically, that is exactly what's happened. What does he say in verse 13? We're called into liberty. What's that? we called into liberty. We are called into liberty. We are free. Free. But to serve one. But. But. <laughs> but to serve one, one another. Ah. We're free, but don't use your freedom as an opportunity for, in my translation, self-indulgence, which I think is a real good, good word for self-indulgence. Don't use your freedom to indulge yourself. Now, how might one per, how, how might a person use his or her freedom to indulge himself or herself? If you didn't have to follow the law, you could rip someone off. And that, that's right. For your own benefit. Yeah. You can do pretty much anything you want. If I'm free from the law, I can do anything. But, and I'm going to do it to indulge myself. I'm going to do it to get what I want. Instead, but he says, don't, that's the danger. Don't use your freedom to indulge yourself. Instead, how should you use your freedom? Love your neighbor as yourself. Right. You use the freedom to love your neighbor as your yourself. Now, interesting, the Galatians had come, thanks to the false teachers, to believe that the law should be used to to do what? What did the Galatians? How would the Galatians have been deceived with respect to the law? What did they assume the law was doing? Up, What's building, that? Building up the faith. Like building, the faith. building up the faith. Making them closer to God, right? Yeah. Which is really interesting because that means they were using the law to do what? For their own advantage. They were indulging themselves yeah. using the law. And he says, the, you missed the whole point of the law because the whole point of the law is what? Loving. How to live. How to love. Well, loving. Does it say? Each other. Yeah, it's it's loving one another. Yeah. You know, it's loving your neighbor. That's the purpose of the law. It's not getting yourself something. It's giving something to someone else. It's loving someone else. So it it's not self indulgent. Now, what have they been doing? In fact, they can you can see the Galatians should be able to see that what what they've been exposed to, these false teachings, this isn't live, leading to loving action, right? What's ended up happening in the Galatian church according to what Paul says in verse 15? What are the Galatians doing in the church? Which, of course, we never see happen in the modern church. They're devouring each other. They're devouring, biting, and devouring one another, Right? So what's happening in the what does Paul say has happened, which proves that you're not you're not paying attention to what the law is supposed to be, which is to lead you. Spirit, one on the flesh. That's right. That's right. Paul challenges them instead of consuming one another, biting and scratching and acting foolish, they should be living by the spirit and not gratifying the flesh, not taking about, now, when it, he talks about desires of the flesh, what is, what is that? What does he say about the desires of the flesh? Now, really tempting for us to say, oh, okay, we're going to separate ourselves from what Paul says, the whole letter, and we're just going to assume this is what he meant because this is what we think when we hear flesh. By what Paul, by what Paul has said, what would be flesh? He says, flesh desires are opposed to the spirit, and spirit desires are opposed to the flesh, for they oppose to one another. 
in the context that Paul has already established, what would living, living, uh, what would fleshly desires, a living according to the flesh, as opposed to the spirit, what would that look like? Because I'll tell you, I think it looks radically different than how we would normally think. Unselfish. Okay, what, what would be unselfish? Living flesh or spirit? By the spirit. Living by the spirit. It's, it's not indulging self. Now, if you want to do that sexually, okay, fine. But for, in Paul's context, it may have more to do with following these rigid laws. Would also be living by the flesh. You know, that would be based on what he said. The, the Galatians, Lord have mercy. The Galatians of the church, they got no problem with people running around acting foolish. That's what the, that's what the Corinthians were doing. The Galatians, on the other hand, were circumcising everything in sight and coming out with new laws to follow to be closer to God. You know, that's the problem in the Galatian church. You know, uh, and that's what Paul is saying. I think that's what Paul is saying, living by the flesh, because it's self They're doing it to indulge themselves. They're doing it so they feel better. Not the person next to them, but so that they feel better. Now, if you're led by the Spirit, What's your relationship with the law? You have one. Yeah, you, that's what he said. You're not subject to the law anymore if you're led by the Spirit. But remember, the whole law is grounded in what command? What he's already said. What's the command? It's the basis of the whole law. Love your neighbor. Love your neighbor. Yeah. Yeah, now, so that's the basis of the law. And so, so you're go, going to be um, in keeping with the law anyway. You know what? What circumstances are there going to be where living by the spirit, unselfishly by the spirit, contradicts the law? There's not exactly that. I think is exactly what he's saying because when then he starts talking about the the uh, works of the flesh and what are the works of the flesh. In verse 19. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, I, sexual immorality, moral corruption, yeah. doing whatever feels good, idolatry, drug use, and casting spells, hate, fighting, oppression, losing your temper, competitive opposition. All that goes on and on. Yeah, it's a whole long. What do they have in common? What, did that, what does that list have in common? Opposite of the fruits of the spirit. Opposite of the fruits of the spirit. How are they the opposite of the fruits of the spirit? What do all these have in common? Negative. 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 It's, it's negative, right? It's yeah. negative towards others. Yeah. But is it negative towards you? No, it's not. All of these are self-indulgent. All of them involve putting what? Me first. Me first. My needs, my wants, my desires, my thoughts, my values. I am first. I am the center of the universe. It doesn't involve other people. I don't care about other people. I care about me. And that's, those are the works of the, of the flesh. They're, it's focused on me. You know. I mean, we, you can go through and parse them and say, well, if you're not doing these, you're okay. It's, it's, it's about self. You know, no concern for others. What does, he say, what does he say about this assertion? If this is what, if this is what you're doing, if your whole life is geared on, around yourself and what you want, without regard of other people, it's with, about you. What's the result? If you indulge in these, uh, you're not going to inherit the kingdom of God. Okay. Why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you inherit the kingdom of God? You ain't worthy, worthy of it. Well, you, you're, well, actually, yeah, you're not worthy, but you're, you're, you're living. Understand, kingdom of God is a rule of God. It's not a place. You know, you're not in the rule of God. You're not doing what God wants you to do. If this is what you're living, you're not under God's rule. You're under whose rule? Yeah, yeah, well, him or me, you know, maybe the two are the same. Now, Donna, you said there's a contrast. Yep. 
you know, if this is the, 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 the works of the flesh are all self-indulgent, all self-indulgent, tell me about the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit love, is, peace. oh, <laughs> is love, joy, peace. What else? Long-suffering. Long-suffering, patience. Yeah, patience, faith, meekness, temperance, as such is, is, is no law. Ah, that's, that's right. Now, what do they all have in common? It, what's that? Me, me, me. Well, the, yeah. the, the Spirit isn't in me. What, for these fruits of the Spirit, what do you need? What do you have to have to, de to, to demonstrate these fruits of the Spirit? You got to have another person. Oh, spirit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you have to have the Spirit, but you also got to have another person. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you can't be loving by yourself. You can't be patient by yourself. You can't be generous without somebody else. Well, yeah, who are you going to be generous to? You know, self-control is irrelevant. You know, unless there's somebody else there. If the, if the works of the flesh are self-indulgent. Now, if we want to do it, because I think Paul would, if we wanted to push, you know, that's not an exhausted list. There's a lot of other self-indulgent things we could do that has to do with me, including telling other people that you better be circumcised because I think that's what you need to do. Or I'm going to be circumcised in order to be right with God. That's self-indulgent. That's just as much a fruit of the uh, work of the flesh and not a fruit of the Spirit because a fruit of the Spirit involves relationship with other people. You know, one of the things, and I've said this before, that we kind of miss, and this is the advantage of knowing a little bit of Greek, a little bit of Greek. Uh, and in the New Testament, there are two words. The Greeks had, had at least three words for love. You know, Eskimos, what, they have like 30 words for snow. You know, we have one word. We got love. We got snow. We got love. But the Greeks had three words that were related to love that we translate love. One isn't used in the, Bible, in the New Testament at all. But two of the three are. Agape. Agape is one, and philios is the other. Philadelphia. Philios delphos. Delphos means brother. Philadelphia literally means in Greek, city of brotherly love. I mean, that's the city of Philadelphia. That's what it is. Um, and so there are two words. One, the filials is emotional, is, a, is emotional love. It's what friends feel towards one another. It's, what's, it's what husbands and wives feel towards one another. It's, it's emotional. It, it's like really liking a person. But it's something you don't control. I mean, you can't choose, oh, I'm going to like her. Well, I'm going to like him. Heck, I tried that. I tried to get girls to like me. I didn't work. You know, you can't make somebody love you. Um, no, you can't do it. Uh, or at least I never figured out how. Um, I was thinking of love potion number nine. Uh, you know, maybe that's, that's possible. But um, you, it's an emotional thing. It, it just happens. Agape, on the other hand, is something very different. Uh, agape is always defined by action. And it, it is like being loving towards somebody. Now, I cannot fit with filios. I can't love somebody I don't like. That's impossible because it's emotional. I can pretend I do, but I can't really do it. Agape, I can love somebody. If it's agape love, I can love somebody I don't like because it's treating my enemy with patience, kindness, you know, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. I can do that. That I can do. Maybe hard, but I can do it. Because that's an act of will. That's an act of decision. And that's the, that's the agape, right? The first one is agape. And that's what Paul says Christians are called to do. That's what he says in 1 Corinthians 13. Okay, and why does he say against this is no law? There's no law against any of this. Why does he say there's no law against 
the fruit of the Spirit. Why is there no law? Why would there be no law against this kind of lifestyle? Why does there need to be? There need to be. Because what does the law tell you to do? Well, the law tells you, what did uh, both Jesus and Paul just say the whole law can be summed up in what? Trust in grace. Well, law. Law. The whole law can be summed up in, and he explains it in greater detail in Romans. The whole law is one command, right? doesn't even do two. Jesus said two. Paul says one. There's one command, and that's to love, love others. That's the command. Love others. Well, if you're being, if you're being loving, if you're showing joy, if you're showing peace, patience, kindness, you don't need a law to say that's what you need to do because you what? Are you doing, doing it? You know, so the law is no longer necessary. That's why we can be free. Because if we're led by the Spirit, this is what we're going to be doing, right? Why are we able to do it in 24? Because somebody in the room is going to raise a hand and say, well, Paul, you forgot something pretty important. You're talking about sin, right? What does it say in verse 24? Verse 24 of chapter 5. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the self with its passions and desires. What, is, what does that mean? What, what does that mean? Because he just said, flesh is self-indulgent. All the works of the flesh are self-indulgent. He says, and here's the fruit of the Spirit. Man, the, the flesh has been crucified. What's he, what's he mean by that? So don't worry about being drawn to this self-indulgent side because that's been crucified. Paul, and we, again, this is something else we'll talk more about in Romans. Paul believed something really special with the crucifixion. And he'll write about it in Romans. That when Jesus Christ died on a cross, we died with him. We died, we died with him and in him. We died with him and in him. Paul believed that there is uh, that Paul Paul didn't believe death was a punishment. Paul believed death was actually a like a it was a wage. It was something given to us by God. Because death breaks the power of sin. Makes sense, right? Because once you're dead, what? You're not gonna sin. You know, the, so the power of sin has over you is gone when you're dead. Dead people don't sin, right? The only problem is you're dead. Yeah, and therefore you're not doing much, right? Yeah. Paul says what is remarkable about the Christ, uh, the cross is that when Jesus Christ died, who else died? We did. We died. Yeah. And that's why the cross breaks the power of sin. You know, we are with Christ, we are in Christ. Therefore, we died. Therefore, the power of sin is broken. It's gone. The power of the flesh is gone. We, what he says here is, we don't have to obey the flesh anymore. We don't have to be self-indulgent. We don't have to do that anymore. Because Jesus Christ did die. Remember, he talked about coming of age. You know, we don't need a guardian. That's what he says. You know, that now that Christ is, has the cross, the flesh has been broken, but even more than that, we also have been given what? Not only were we dead as a result of the cross, what have we received? Walk the Spirit. We've got the Spirit, which enables us to truly love. Now we're able to love. So the power of the flesh has been broken. That self-indulgence is broken. Now we can, we can love. Now we can give to others. Now we can be truly loving. And practically for the Galatians in verse 26, how is that? How will believing that change their lives today? 
according to what he says in 26. Don't be conceited in provoking one another. Now you don't have to do this anymore. You don't have to indulge, you don't have to be uh, conceited, which is self, a self-indulgent. You know, you don't have to compete against one another. You don't have to envy one another. You don't have to do that anymore because that died on the cross. All that other stuff is dead. Now we can live by the Spirit, which is also a gift given to us by God. Now, using his argument, using his argument, and that's where we know it's there because of grace and and faith, what happens when uh, a person drifts away from this and they were in the spirit but are now doing you know sort of self-indulgent which is what the Galatians have been doing with this circumcision business repentance okay good now if if that's what you if you've drifted into you've done what Paul says the Galatians have done okay and you've drifted away from God and now you're going to look for ways that you can be right with God instead of looking for ways you can love other people. You'll focus on getting it for yourself. You've drifted away because these people have deceived you. Okay? How can we bring them back? How can we, what does Paul say about how we can bring those folks who have drifted away back? Because we don't want to mark them down as lost. How can we bring them back? By showing them repentance. <laughs> By showing them obey the law of Christ. Okay. Should we chew them out? Mm-hmm. Lead them gently back to the right path. Ah, so we're gonna we're gonna do it gently. Why would we do? Why does this really dictate that we got to do it gently? Because otherwise, you are we'll drive them away. That's it. Yeah. That's it. We're gonna drive them away because we're gonna become just like them. Right. You know, and becoming just like them isn't the way you restore. You you don't restore something by becoming as bad as the person you want to restore. You know, it's it, it's sort of like um, you know. Um, uh, we do away in sin. Well, I, you know, I'm, I'm I'm thinking. You know, when I was a kid going to elementary school, if we got on a we got a fight into a fight on the playground. You know what the consequence of getting in a fight on the playground was? Going to Mr. Sprinkle. Now, why was going to Mr. Sprinkle? No, no, it was a real man named like James Sprinkle. That was his last name. Mr. Sprinkle, he was a gym teacher. <laughs> kind of sounds odd. Oh, kind of yeah, so, yeah. Mr. Sprinkle. You know what going to Mr. Sprinkle meant? Death. Wow. <laughs> Uh, what? Oh, I wish it would lapse. Mr. Sprinkle, you were right, Donna, because we're, we're of the same generation. Uh, Mr. Sprinkle had a paddle that was this wide. Mm-hmm. Probably drove full of holes. Full of holes. And when you got, when you got into a fight on the playground, you got a swat. You got a swat with Mr. Sprinkle. And there were so many things wrong with this. Looking back, you know, so many things wrong. Because you'd go in, and Mr. Sprinkle would say, What'd you do? Well, he didn't care what you did. He got word. He knew exactly what you did. Uh, he'd say, Drop your pants. Jeez, just that would cause Mr. Sprinkle to be fired. Uh-huh. Now, maybe his name, Mr. Sprinkle, would do it. But drop your pants, lean against the desk. And he so would, positioned. he would right. get back, and I can remember, and I was only whacked once when he w- brought that paddle, that thin paddle. You could hear it crack. Whistle. Well, whistle! You could hear it whistle before it cracked. You heard it whistle. The air going through those holes, and he would just once, boom. Now looking back, and then walking home. Afterwards, because we walked to school, walking home, just saying a word of prayer. Mr. Sprinkle, please don't have called home. Because what Mr. Sprinkle did paled in comparison to what my father was, was going to do if he got a call from Mr. Sprinkle. You know, it wasn't going to be yelling at him, it was going to be. You're going to get it twice as bad. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. 
Oh, yeah. You thought that was bad. But you know, when you think about it, Mr. Sprinkle was teaching us not to be violent by being incredibly violent. Yeah. You know, by being, you know, by being really, really violent. You know, that's probably not the best way to teach kids not to be violent towards one another, is to beat them up, is Still to the whack them. <laughs> they was paying you. Too terrible you know? to do it again. I, I, you know, but that's the kind of stuff we do. And, and, but you don't want to do that. If somebody falls away, you sure. bring them back. You bring them back gently. In fact, what perspective should you have if you feel the temptation that those who have drifted away, you are going to, you know, do whatever's necessary to get them back, you know, because there's a temptation to to be a little harsher, to be just like they are. What should what should we remember? And now we're into chapter six. What do we need to remember according to verse two? Verse two. Carry each other's we need if we're thinking about carrying one another's burdens. You know what we're not going to be doing. We're not going to be swinging a paddle with holes in it, right? We're not going to be doing it. If we're bearing one another's burdens, we are going to, and that's fulfilling the law of Christ, which is, what's his law? Love one another. Love one another. We're not going to think we're better. You know, we're not, we're not going to, we're not going to, uh, we're just not going to do it. Um, and in fact, what might we want to start doing to avoiding that temp to avoid that temptation? Let let maybe we need to start testing our works a little bit. And and what does what does what do you think testing works means? What do you mean if it's a tech tech test your own works? Accountability. Yes. yes. As opposed to, so making yourself accountable as opposed to doing what? Making someone else. Testing your neighbor's works and making your neighbor accountable. Maybe if we start by looking at ourselves. Now, do, can you think of an illustration? I'm thinking of one right now. An illustration that Jesus uses that is amazingly similar that I think if Paul knew it, he probably would have used it. Uh, but evidently he didn't because he doesn't. But it's an illustration we see in the gospel that Jesus uses. This, this Instead of judging, maybe you need to judge yourself. Look at yourself before you start looking at others. Can you think of that little illustration? Yeah, take the splinter out of your eye. Yeah, yeah. The log. Yeah. That maybe instead of look pointing at the splinter and the speck in somebody else's eye, you should consider taking the log. Out. Yeah, the log that's in your eye, and that's really sort of what he's what he's saying. Okay, where's that? Well, no, that's that's. I think that's what he's saying. I think when he says uh, test your own work, uh, then that work rather than your neighbor's work will become the cause of pride. I think he's saying the same thing. Look at what you're doing. Spend more time looking at what you're doing yeah. than what your neighbor's doing. Um, That's true. <laughs> you know, uh, and you know, we're carrying our own loads. We're accountable for our own own actions. So judge yourself before you run around and judge others. Um, and what practice is is kind of reflected in this? What is what 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 practice should we be doing? What what does he what does he say? we should, what does he challenge us to do? What, he, he says something about sowing, right? He says there's a general principle in, in verse 7. Man soweth whatever you can't fool God. You, want you, want you, can, you can't fool God, you know, which I love. You know, you, you, you're not going oh, yeah, to be able to... You reap what you sow. You reap what you... The bottom line is you reap what you sow. Therefore, if you... What? If you... If you, if you sow destruction, you're going to get destructed. But? If you follow service, the Spirit, you will have eternal life. And Paul says, we are... What's the What time of year are we in? Due season. 
We are we're ready to reap. We're at harvest time. Mm. So we don't need to, we shouldn't give up. Uh, we should we should push forward. Now this is this is what Paul has said. Now to this point, it would appear as though Paul has been dictating, and a scribe has been writing it, writing what Paul says, because in verse eleven, what does Paul? See the big letters I'm writing. <laughs> that I'm writing with my own hand now. Notice how big the letters are. So to this point, he's got a scribe writing very small, sort of like me, tiny little letters so you can get a lot on a page. But now, because he wants to be personal, he's writing and his letters are bigger. The handwriting is different. And it's not surprising that the, letter, that the letters are bigger because remember a little earlier when he was talking about what the Galatians had done for him, you remember the example he gave? The, they were so concerned about him, they would have taken out their eyes, their own eyes, and given it to him. Which must show that Paul, probably showed that Paul, the problem Paul faced had to do with his eyesight. You know, that that was the, the ailment that they had to put up with, is that Paul had really bad eyesight. And they would have been willing to trade eyes with him. They loved him that much. And that's why it makes sense that now that he's writing it himself, the letters are now a bit because he can't see very well. And, what, and so this is now him writing. Uh, how does he, how does, so we're coming in for a landing. How does he relate this ethic that he said? That he just established. Don't go for indulging yourself. Instead, love other people, how does that relate to the the Galatians? You don't know where. We're at verse seven. We're moving verse eleven and twelve of chapter six. What is that that you like? In verse twelve, it says these people are telling you to. They're telling you to get circumcised. They're only trying to show how important they are. Now, understand, I think that's addressing a possible problem. Paul, like I said, Paul is a plotter. He mm -hmm. likes to make sure somebody in the room might raise their hand and say, well, Paul, these people that are telling us to be circumcised, they're doing that for us. Mm -hmm. They're showing love for us. What does Paul say? Uh-uh. Mm -hmm. Why are they teaching you, telling you to be circumcised? Are they doing it for you? Mm -mm. Heck no. What they're, doing why they, to gratify themselves. they're doing it to gratify themselves. They're doing it to please. And if yeah. they're doing something to gratify themselves, then what, where, where, where are they? Are they in the spirit or in the flesh? In the they're flesh. in the flesh. So even this, by telling them to obey the law, they're only telling them to obey the law so that they feel good about it. Yeah. Which means they are just as self-indulgent like as, as someone who, who envies and steals and cheats and robs and lies. They are just as self-indulgent. What did you say you liked? This, when 13... Where they say they don't circumcise, but they don't obey the law of Moses. All they want to do is brag about having you circumcised. Right. Which is what? Which is what? What is he suggesting about those people? Hypocrites. They're hypocrites. Yeah. Yeah. They're they're talking about, and this again is the problem Paul's already established about the law. You can't obey one. You got to obey them all. You got to obey them all. And they ain't obeying them all. Mm. You know, they aren't obeying them all. But they're telling you to obey one. Verse 12 in this translation says, Whoever wants to look good by human standards will try to get you to be circumcised. Um, yeah. Once will try to get you to be circumcised. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. only so they won't be harassed. Get in trouble with the cross of Christ. Mm -hmm. 
why, why would this enable them to avoid being persecuted for the cross? What did Paul just say the cross did? What did Paul just say the cross of Jesus Christ did? Freeze you. What's that? Freeze you. Freeze! Sets us free! You know, that's why they're getting persecuted. Who would be persecuted? Who would be persecuted? Now that's kind of interesting. Who would be persecuting these false teachers? What, who would be, if they started, if these false teachers started to say, you've been set free in the, by the cross of Jesus Christ. The cross has set you free. The Jews. The Jews. It would be the Jews that would be persecuting them. It's not the Romans. It'd be the Jews that would persecute them. Because the Jews are saying, you're not free at all. you got to do what? you got to obey the law. They, so they're telling you to be circumcised so that they don't have to put up with persecution if they told you the truth. And the truth is, you are set free by the cross of Jesus Christ. Yeah. They are protecting themselves, which means their actions are what? Self-indulgent. Yeah. In the flesh. Now, on the other hand, what is Paul's boast? If, if they are preaching circumcision to avoid talking about talking about freedom in the cross, what is Paul boast? What is he boasting in? Cross. He's boasting in the freedom of the cross. Yeah. You know, he's, he's boasting in what, what happened to the cross. He's not avoiding it. He's boasting in it. Now, I think that verse 15 and 16 really important. Because how does he close this? Because he's really been harsh on these guys that are preaching circumcision, right? Really, really hard on them. He wishes they would castrate themselves for crying out loud. That's pretty harsh. How does he conclude this letter? Saying that Jesus wasn't circumcised. Well, what, what does he say is, when you get right down to it, the, what is the new reality? Christ. Christ is the new reality, which means freedom. Freedom, and you know when you get right down to it, circumcision doesn't mean nothing. Means or what? Because he's he's gonna he's gonna at, before he leaves this, he's gonna say being circumcised doesn't mean anything, and. All that matters is that you are a new person. Yeah, not being circumcised doesn't mean anything. So he doesn't want to open the door for, and this is going to be the problem in Romans, you know, that those who, who haven't been circumcised can turn around and say, well, see, you got circumcised. I'm closer to God than you. You're bound by the law. You're living in the flesh because you got circumcised. But I didn't because now I experience more freedom. He says, you know, when you get right down to it, Matter. It doesn't matter. What does matter? Jesus Christ matters. Yeah. That's what matters. This other stuff doesn't. And like I said, he goes into a lot of detail in Romans about this, particularly about whether to eat meat offered to idols or only vegetables. He also talks about whether you should have one day above another. We kind of had that conversation the other day. You know, Paul says, you know, it just doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. If you glorify God, that's what's important. Doesn't matter whether you do it one day. You should be doing it every day. You know, you don't hold one day special to glorify God. You should be doing it every day. So one day isn't more special. But if you think it is, that's okay. Right. It, if you're glorifying God, look, it doesn't matter whether you eat meat off of idols or only vegetables. If you give God thanks for it, it doesn't, it doesn't make any difference. Just if if you don't eat if you don't eat meat, don't judge the person who does. And if you eat meat, don't mock the person who doesn't. <laughs> you know, that's the problem. But whether you eat it or not, as long as you bring glory to God, it doesn't matter. And this is, this is what Paul is writing to the Galatians. This is the same sort of thing he's going to write to the Romans, but he's going to come to it from a different angle.
because his audience is different. You know, the Roman, and we'll talk about that next week, the Roman audience is, is unique and different, certainly than the Galatian. And they are facing a unique problem that probably wasn't faced anywhere else in the world, but it was faced in Rome. And in a sense, we kind of face it now. I mean, this is, I think, applicable to us because we build laws, right? What kind of ways do we compromise grace and faith and freedom? How do we compromise those things within Christianity? I mean, I think this, this is a stupid example, but dress at one time. You know, you can't come to worship unless you're dressed for it. You don't, too. You don't, right? Look, if it, you should be able to dress up once a week. Mm-hmm. You know, that shows proper respect. What's wrong mm-hmm. with you? That's the way it was in Church of Christ. That's the way it is. Wear your suit. Lord have mercy. That's the way it was in the Presbyterian Church in the South. I remember my dad caused all kinds of problems when he wore a sport coat and a tie and not a suit to church on Sunday because in the 60s you wore a suit. It was this way that way here one time. Yeah. Ladies wore hats. And gloves. And I cleaned all the covers with my finger and then I'd get beat once again. Now, <laughs> my finger would be all dirty. What's well, interesting when you talk about clothes, you know, uh, years ago had a woman tell me, because I, I wore, until I came here, I always wore a collar. And that's why I have this shirt. There's a buttonhole right back here for my collar. Uh, so I could, could I always, always wore it. Uh, and she said she didn't like that. A woman, I, I didn't know her. I didn't even know her. She said she didn't, why did I dress like that? And I said, well, you know, there's several reasons. One, I don't, I don't have to worry about ties matching <laughs> clothes. And, and I think it's very simple. And symbolically, I like what it meant. It's, it symbolizes a slave's collar because that's you know, what you slaves wore, collars around their neck because that freed up their hands that they could do work and their feet you know, without, you know, if you chain up arms, you're limiting motion. So they would chain it with a collar. And that's what a collar symbolically meant. We were servants. And um, I said, that's why, she said, well, I don't like that. I, don't, I think you shouldn't do it. Yeah. You know, my minister wears, and I remember she said, and I remember it, she said, he wears a jolly, jolly orange jumpsuit on Sunday, and we love it. And that's what you should wear. And I said, well, I'm going to tell you something. If I showed up in church wearing a jolly orange jumpsuit. It'd say DOC you, on the back of it? Yeah, that's, that's right. It, well, it is, uh, you know, it is the new black. Um, the, um, but, yeah, I said, they'd laugh me out of the building. You know, nobody would listen to my sermon. They'd be looking at me wearing the jolly, jolly orange jumpsuit, you know, and I wouldn't feel comfortable. I'd, have, I'd really be a barrier for me. So I don't want to do it. Well, you should. What's wrong with you? I said, well, I, I don't think we can talk. I, I mean, I don't know where we're going to go with this. We, we're just going to disagree. But that's what you, so dress cuts both, can cut both ways. You know, that uh, in the past we were real formal and now, you know, less formal. But if we make informality the law, there you go. Right now, we, right. now we're self-indulgent again. Yep. So churches, we Christians need to be real <coughs> careful. Uh, maybe, and that's a tendency that we have because we want to feel comfortable. And following the law helps us feel comfortable. Creating laws that we obey helps us feel comfortable with ourselves. But that really is kind of self-indulgent. And maybe we should be working against that in our own lives. You know, we shouldn't be indulging that. Okay. Anyway, any, any questions about Galatians? Cool letter. Like Galatians. Next week it'll be Romans. Romans. Oh. Paul's, 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 Paul's opus. The only church, the only letter that he wrote to a church that he had never visited. Uh, which means he's, part of the letter is introducing himself. They knew about him, but he'd never been there. Oh, Galatians, uh, Romans, that's, that's, a, that's an interesting letter, especially when you know a little of the background. Yeah. Okay, let's have a word of prayer and then go home. Lord God, thank you so much for giving us this time together. Uh, remind us that our relationship with you, regardless of what we may have been told or what we may want to believe, our relationship with you is not based on us. It's based on you. 
is based on an undeserved, unearned grace that you've given to us that we can simply trust has been given. You've set us free. You've set us free from the ought to's and the should's and the must's because you've shown us grace. Now, help us to be guided as we relate to others by the one principle your son left us, the summation of the law, that we love one another. Help that to be our guide, not because we have to, but because we want to. In the name of Christ we pray, amen. Amen.